All right. Hooray. Now we have tech. <laughs> um, I apologize for the delay, but now we have slides. So that's exciting. Um, so just a couple of um, general announcements uh, before I get started. Um, remember that you have your uh, first inquisitive assignment due today by five. Um, so please go ahead and work on that and let me know if you have questions. Um, we will be having lab tomorrow, um, in fact, here. Um, and uh, tomorrow is a lab where we're going to be working with um, the mice to both identify some of the organs we've been talking about in the immune system and also um, to harvest some of those so that we can actually use them for ourselves for the rest of the semester. Um, and this is the one where I noted that you probably want to pair up in a situation where if you are less excited about doing this, that maybe you pair with someone who is more excited about doing this and are perhaps a bit more of the um, assistant. Um, and um, you do not need to be with your like longer term lab partner <laughs> um, in working on that. Um, so that is our plan for tomorrow. Um, if you go on the Moodle site right now, you can also, you'll also find that there are um, practice problems about um, exam one material in general, as well as um, specifically an innate immunity set of practice problems um, that I would use in past years as a problem set, but I just put it up as practice stuff for you this year. Um, as well as all the old exam ones and keys. So all of those things are available on the Moodle site for practice. Um, I will let you know when I am up to date with putting videos onto YouTube. Um, so today we are going to um, continue talking about innate immune responses. Uh, we have a couple of points that I left about complement that I didn't finish last time. So I want to make a couple of points about complement. And then I'm going to move into thinking about the cellular innate immune response, um, more commonly known as the inflammatory response. So if you uh, recall from Friday, we were talking about the complement cascade when we left off. We saw that there were uh, three different ways that we could initiate the complement cascade. All three of them come together into the activation of C3B. And once um, we have this C3B activation, we can get um, a number of different downstream effector functions, either um, the membrane attack complex or lysis, which is lysis opsonization or inflammation. And we went all the way through the classical pathway and the lectin pathway last time. And I had introduced to you the alternative pathway. But I also told you about a problem with the alternative pathway, which is where we left off last time. So if you remember the key part of our um, alternative pathway has to do with the structure of the protein C3. C3 has um, a thioester bond in that protein, which is unstable. It's under a lot of strain. Um, and it will sometimes spontaneously cleave, leading to this very reactive um, nucleophile being produced. If the closest thing is water, then we make this inactive C3B and no one cares ever again. But if the closest thing is an OH group or an NH2 group on some other type of biological molecule, then immediately that C3B nucleophile is going to attach as it shows here, to a pathogen surface. And so 
you can imagine this as being fantastic in terms of thinking about how we deal with microbial pathogens very quickly. We didn't really have to do much of anything to prep to, get, to um, start the alternative pathway of complement fixation on this pathogen surface. It happened pretty much immediately as soon as the pathogen was there. We immediately kind of stuck a little sticky of C3B on it to start destruction. So that's fabulous. But the problem is that OHs and NH2s are found in all sorts of biological molecules, including on your cells. Most of the biological molecules that make up your cells have those kind of moieties as well. And so just like we have this ability to immediately stick a C3 onto pathogen surfaces really quickly, we also can potentially stick C3s onto the surfaces of your cells. Um, and I told you last time that that in fact does happen. You are getting C3 deposited on your cells right now. Um, happily, none of you succumbed to the membrane attack complex over break or over the long weekend. Um, so something must happen to, to make sure that that does not occur. The answer to what will happen is that all of your cells express a variety of complement inhibitors. So there are complement inhibitors that can inhibit every single step of the alternative and the classical and the MBL pathway. These are some examples. So here you can see um, this I and H factor that sort of inactivate C3. You can see um, one DAF that gets rid of um, deposited complement. You can see another one, MCP. And even a, a final one, CD59, that gets in the way of the membrane attack complex when it tries to form. Basically, every single step of the complement cascade that we talked about has some kind of inhibitor that is made by your cells. And so right now, C3 is attacking to all of your cells, and your cells are brushing it off <laughs> and basically inhibiting it as soon as it um, comes on. While microbial cells don't have the ability to inhibit C uh, complement in the same way, and so they are actually getting attacked. You may hear this and think that this sounds incredibly inefficient. Um, and in a lot of ways, yup. And the immune system is incredibly inefficient in so many ways. But the general idea is that we want to have an immune response that's so fast and so broad that we'll sacrifice efficiency. Um, and this is going to be really fast. It's just that that means we have to be constantly inhibiting it on our cells. One of the reasons why we have realized that complement um, plays a role in certain types of diseases, particularly in different types of arthritis, is that what's really important from, these title, from the title of this slide and the previous is it says, our cell express complement inhibitors. Bone surface is a surface and not a cell. And so, for example, your joints don't have any complement inhibitors. And the complement can actually start to build up in the joints um, because it, you're not inhibiting complement in the same way on a surface as you are by, uh, on a cell. Um, and so this is one uh, kind of place where we've seen that this uh, whole situation breaks down a little bit. Um, the one other thing I want to point out about um, complement, um, I could have pointed the same thing out about other antimicrobial peptides, um, but I can only say so many things, um, is that there are patients who have defects in different complement proteins. So there are patients who 
um, are missing C3. There's missing C3, missing C3, missing 1, 2, or 4, missing 5 through 9, missing any of these other components. There are, so there are patients that will have mutations where they are missing a particular complement protein. Um, in most cases, those patients seem to have particular susceptibility to some types of bacterial pathogens. Um, it's not necessarily all. It's a little bit weird. Um, this is one thing that we realize when we think about immune genetics is that the immune system sometimes like overlaps and covers for itself. And there will often be like one pathogen that it can't deal with if it gets rid of a protein. But a lot of other ones it can deal with with the overlap. Um, so there are certain types of bacteria these patients um, have trouble with. Um, and this is one particular uh, type of disease. There also are some um, patients who are missing the complement inhibitors. And those patients have autoimmune-like syndromes um, where they are starting to see some complement um, problems happening, complement attack happening on their cells. Yep? Uh, so I had a question regarding the mm -hmm. uh, Does everyone have to have some sort of a deficiency or are there like, you have their people who have no deficiency? No, m many people have no deficiency at all. Um, most people have a complete, have sort of the standard complement cascade as I've shown you. But there are some patients whose um, disease is defined by being missing some kind of complement protein. Um, I'm guessing that you asked that because you wanted to know why people get sick. <laughs> oh, so most people have the whole perfect complement cascade. OK, so what we've been talking about when we talk about antimicrobial peptides is sort of this immediate innate immune response. And the key thing is that all of these antimicrobial proteins um, that are present in this humoral response are preformed. They're already there. You don't have to transcribe or translate them. They can start working the minute the microbe gets into your body. Sometimes they do the job and completely eliminate the microbe. And then you live happily ever after. Sometimes they don't. If that microbe is not completely eliminated by those antimicrobial peptides in that first few hours following infection, then the next layer of the innate immune response starts to play a role. Um, this you can see is happening from about four hours after infection to about four days. Um, and here, we're going to start seeing cells doing something to act against this microbe. We're still in the innate immune response, but now we've got cells. And those cells have to be activated and have to do some stuff before they're ready to kill the microbe. And so that's why it takes a little while compared to those preformed proteins. As we talk through this process today, we are going to see two key types of cells that are going to be involved in this process. One of those cell types is the neutrophil. The other is the macrophage. I am representing my neutrophils and my macrophage today as well. Um, you learned about these last week. You saw them in lab a bunch last week. If you look at um, this figure from your textbook, there's something that you might notice about these two cell types. So you can see it tells us the function of these two cell types in this figure. And what do you notice about the function of the cell types in, these two fi in this figure? Yeah, Michael. They're the same. They both say phagocytosis and killing of microorganisms. When we learned about these cells last week, we learned about them as both cells of the innate immune system. They're both 
myeloid cells. Oftentimes, students really want to switch neutrophils and macrophages around and think that they're the same thing. They're actually not. <laughs> and as we talk about them today, we're going to talk about some things that are unique about them as well. So it is absolutely true that both of them um, do a lot of phagocytosis. And phagocytosis and killing of microbes is a big deal for both of them. They are both innate immune cells. But they've got some big differences. So keep your eyes out for some of those big differences as we go through this process today. And the process that we're talking about is um, the process that most people think of and know of as inflammation. So um, you know some things about inflammation. Um, I told you on the first day that we've got some situations where immunologists have people made observations about immunology a really long time ago. Um, with inflammation, that is very much true. Um, inflammation was first described by the Romans um, who talked about there being four cardinal signs of inflammation, four things that happen to you that um, are how you know inflammation is going on. So you've probably had this happen to you before. What are the four things that happen when you have inflammation? You don't need to name all four. You can just name one. Yep. Redness. Redness. Okay. Yeah. It gets hotter. Heat. Swelling. And what's the fourth one? Yeah. Pain. <laughs> exactly. Um, so redness, heat, swelling, and pain. Um, the Romans called those ruber, calor, tumor, and dolor. I was trying to make sure I was doing it in the same order that you guys said them. <laughs> um, and all of those things are actually related to the um, processes we're going to see with functions of innate immune cells. And so we're going to be talking through this process. I will largely be using an example like the example we're seeing here, where we have some nice healthy skin that then gets some kind of surface wound, and we start to get inflammation at that site. And so you can imagine that happening. Um, for reasons I never understood, my professors in uh, grad school always wanted to talk about this as what would happen if someone slammed their hand on the podium very hard and got a wound. So I don't know why we're slamming your hands on the podium, but if I slammed my hand on the podium and got a cut, this is what would happen. You've likely heard the word inflammation before. I'm sure you've heard it. If you went out and talked to people who were non-scientists about inflammation, they would probably tell you that it's terrible. They would say all sorts of bad things about it. They tell you it was the worst thing ever. If you watch um, TV, you'll see lots of types of products that are going to get rid of your inflammation, especially to you know, get rid of your wrinkles and things. Um, but one thing that I want you to know is that inflammation is, is in fact, an important physiologic process. If you did not have any inflammation at all in your body, it would be really, really, really bad. My guess is that on Friday, we'll, be, we'll get to some of the reasons why inflammation can be a bad thing. But in most cases, it's an important, very good physiological process. It is how you deal with infection, tissue injury, or tissue stress in order to have defense, repair, and restoration of homeostasis. The first part of this process is going to happen because of really macrophages. So we're going to start out with some macrophages for this process. These macrophages live in lots of different tissues in your body. So in my skin example, there are currently macrophages living in my skin. So we're going to start out 
with the macrophages that live wherever. If we were having lung inflammation, it'd be the lung macrophages. If we were having brain inflammation, it'd be the brain macrophages. Here it's going to be some skin macrophages. In this figure, because it's from chapter one, it's a little oversimplified, but we're going to use it. You can see there's a cell hanging out in the healthy skin. And that it, here it's called an effector cell. It's the skin macrophage. So here's our skin macrophage. It's just chilling in the healthy skin. Once we have bacteria introduced, perhaps because of this wound that we got, I guess we have little like, are those like stones or something? I don't know. But we get some bacteria. Now, those macrophages are going to be activated and are going to start this process of inflammation. And so the first thing that we want to think about in this process is how in the world do the macrophages know that there are bacteria present? Um, so if the macrophage is going to be activated by the bacteria and start doing something, then that macrophage has to know that there are bacteria present. They don't have eyes. <laughs> um, so we have to figure out how they understand that there are these bacteria present. Um, the way that they do this is that they have lots of different receptors on their surface, also uh, inside of the cell as well, though we're just seeing them on the surface here that can recognize aspects of our bacteria or of our microbe that are found only in bacteria or microbes. They are things that are non-self. So the macrophage has these receptors that are going to help it detect things that are non-self. So this, this doesn't belong here. This is not me um, in order to start this process. These receptors are known as PRRs. And PRR stands for Pattern Recognition Receptor. So, oh my gosh, it's a receptor. It has receptor in its name. And that receptor is recognizing things that are sort of unique to microbes. It's a pattern that many microbes have. The macrophage will have many pattern recognition receptors, not just one so that it can detect many different microbial patterns. You can also see that here with many different microbial, uh, many different uh, pattern recognition receptors. And these pattern recognition receptors are things that are characteristic of broad classes of microbes. So this is not a situation where you're gonna have a receptor that only recognizes SARS-CoV-2 Omicron and not SARS-CoV-2 Delta. Instead, this receptor might be recognizing RNA viruses. <laughs> We're recognizing some broad class of microbe. And so what you can see here is that the brown microbe, the yellow microbe, and the purple microbe all have something in common that hits the same receptor. They all have the same pattern. Um, this is pretty useful because um, you don't need quite so many receptors to recognize all the microbes. It's also pretty useful because um, we tend to see recognition of structures that are really important for the microbe's biology. Things that the microbe can't mutate easily to try to avoid the receptor. So um, 
that really helps um, us not have to worry about microbial evolution. We, just like we have a name for the receptor, we also have a name for that part of the microbe, the pattern that is um, recognized. Um, the field has changed terms here. You might see a couple different terms. This is the official most up-to-date term. Um, a, the last, um, so it's MAMP. The, a, the P stands for pattern, because it's the pattern that the receptor recognizes. <laughs> so that goes together. <laughs> um, but then the rest of this is a microbe associated molecular pattern. So it's some part of a microbe, some molecule that's on a microbe that makes up this pattern. Um, in the past, we used to refer to these as PAMPs instead of MAMPs because we would say they were pathogen-associated molecular patterns. But now we realize they're not just on pathogens, they're on other microbes too. So we went to microbe-associated molecular pattern. But if you see PAMP instead of MAMP somewhere, they're the same thing. Um, and this just shows you some examples of some types of MAMPs. Again, we'll talk about some of them a little bit more uh, later on. But you can see things like LPS, which is in the cell wall of many bacteria, or peptidoglycan, which is in the cell wall of many bacteria. There are some that are particular types of nucleic acids that are found only in certain microbes. The microbe's not gonna, gonna mutate to change the structure of DNA, um, or LPS, or peptidoglycan, and so having one receptor for each of those things is going to be great in helping the, the cell to recognize something that is definitely foreign, definitely not us, and something that gives you a recognition of a broad group of pathogens that, cannot easily that we can't easily mutate around. When that macrophage uses its PRR, to recognize a MAMP, there are two things that we're going to think about happening. One of those things is that the, um, so here you can see some PRRs on the surface of a macrophage. You can see microbes being recognized with those PRRs. And the result in this case is that the macrophage is going to do phagocytosis. I mentioned before, phagocytosis is important for our, our macrophage. So the macrophage is going to do phagocytosis. It's going to start to destroy that microbe. Um, I will point out that there is a figure very similar to this in your textbook in 3.4. Um, but for some reason, they wanted to add, they added like two more complicated factors. And I was like, I don't need to show them the complicated version. We're going to show them the simple version first. So if you look at 3.4, it's like an evolution of this. Um, but there is one other big thing that will happen when a macrophage uses its PRR to detect a microbe. So on the left, you can see the thing I already just told you about, phagocytosis. But the second thing that can happen is that we see signal transduction from that receptor and our cell will now start to transcribe and translate some new proteins. 
And so we're going to see this transcriptional response and this response of making these new types of proteins. This is the thing that's really unique about the macrophage. So remember I told you that there were macrophages and neutrophils. They both do phagocytosis. Everybody wants to mix the two together. The neutrophils kind of just do phagocytosis. The macrophages do phagocytosis and this signaling stuff. Um, so they're like the smart ones. Please note, I work on macrophages in my research that I might be biased. <laughs> um, and that signaling can lead to a bunch of different things. Some of them help the macrophage get better at killing microbes. Some of them are involved with wound healing and other types of tissue remodeling. Um, but the third type are the ones that we're really going to care about for the rest of our time today. They're also shown here as these little proteins that get made that are known as inflammatory cytokines. So our macrophage is going to start transcribing the inflammatory cytokines, translating them, and secreting them. So you can see their little triangles that get secreted from the cell. You might guess inflammatory cytokines are involved in inflammation, which is what we're talking about now. They can, as this points out, um, actually also help out with an adaptive immune response. So we've now seen our macrophage in the skin recognize bacteria that have come in and produce inflammatory cytokines. Um, because of the signals they had through those PRRs. So the next thing that we can think about in this process is what those inflammatory cytokines will do. Um, and there are a few different things that those cytokines could do. There also are a few different cytokines that can be made here. The two most famous are called TNF-alpha and IL-6. There are others. Um, some of them are officially inflammatory cytokines. Um, cytokines are messenger molecules in the immune system. They're the messages one immune cell sends out to talk to others. Um, that's really the easiest way to think of cytokines. Here we're talking about inflammatory cytokines. The message they're sending is inflammation. Um, you will see on a subsequent slide that I also do mention chemokines. There is a reason why I mention chemokines. Hopefully it will click as we go. Chemokines is, the word actually means chemotactic cytokine. It's a cytokine that makes something move. Um, there are ridiculous immunology cartoons um, that sometimes, I, I have like so many of these that I'll put in random places. I'm just realizing this would be a perfect place for one of them that I did not do. Um, but it shows a cell making chemokines. And the cell says, my chemokines bring all the boys to the yard. <laughs> so that's the idea. A, a chemokine is going to be a cytokine that makes something move. When we see those cytokines and chemokines being produced in the skin, there are some effects that happen on that specific location um, of the, the, at the skin. 
And so he, I, you've got two panels here, sort of a before and an after, the left and the right. And you can see some of the effects in that specific location. So those effects are not necessarily happening throughout the entire body. They are just happening at that specific location. They are the local effects. One of the things that you can see is that this um, blood vessel that is nearby in the skin changes its diameter. So it goes from kind of skinny to much wider. So we see a change in blood vessel diameter. That's called vasodilation. The vessel dilates. You can also see that the wall of the blood vessel um, gets less tightly packed. So we actually get a change in permeability of the vessel wall. Why might it make sense to dilate or make that vessel bigger? Yep, Jay. Yeah, you're going to let in more blood. That's gonna, that means more immune cells can come, help out. That means more complement proteins can come and help out. You're going to increase the vessel so that you can bring more immune effectors. Why do we make the blood vessel leaky here? Yeah, Michael. So a lot of it's to allow cells um, to actually get to that location. It will also allow things like a sort of bathing in the complement proteins and things like that. So again, you're letting more immune things get to that area to help you deal with bacteria that have gotten in. Yep. So um, the permeability thing potentially could. Um, and so you really hope that you have other aspects of the immune response that are trying to keep those bacterial numbers low. Um, if you completely opened, if you opened all the doors, sure, you'd get some, you could get bacteria in the blood. Um, that's why you've got a lot of things going on here at once. Also realize, as you're bringing in more blood to this site and bringing in more of the liquid to this site, the site's going to get warm because the blood is warm. This site is also going to get swollen because you are pushing more liquid there. This site is going to get red as you get some of this additional blood flow. And so all of those cardinal signs of inflammation are direct results of those inflammatory cytokines and chemokines. Um, you do also get some pain with this. The pain is also uh, involved in signaling um, on local nerves from those inflammatory cytokines, which I'm not going to go into the neuroscience of. <laughs> um, some of these are also going to be chemokines. And those chemokines are going to be recruiting immune cells. They are going to be actually giving out the call to say, hey, immune cells, come here. There is something you need to deal with right here. So we're going to be actively recruiting in cells using those chemokines. Um, one point that I just want you to know, um, I'm going to switch the order of this for a second. Um, there is this whole specific process that those cells go through for recruitment. I'm not going to talk about the process right now. Um, the process actually has the same set of steps later when T-cells do something, and we're going to deal with it then. But there's a set of steps. One part of that involves a chemokine. And just so you know, chemokines have really specific kind of receptors. 
They have seven transmembrane domains. They signal through G proteins. Um, as you learned about in Bio 250. The reason why I tell you this is because on Friday, I told you about two proteins called C3A and C5A that signal through a receptor. How many transmembrane protein or domains does that receptor have? I really hope they drew it right. Hold on. OK, they did. Whew. How many transmembrane domains does that receptor have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The same number that chemokine receptors have. And you know what? This receptor signals through a G protein and leads to changes in vessel diameter and changes in vessel permeability. So basically, C3A and C5A, the complement proteins you saw on Friday, are really just being chemokines. So hopefully you see that this sort of links together. That while I try to put some of these things in different locations in different parts of the immune response, we're seeing a lot of the same themes over and over again. Um, and so these effects that I've told you about in terms of the inflammatory response are what are the sort of local effects of inflammation. So here we can see we might have our person who slams their hand on the podium and they get a cut in their hand. We're going to have this process that I've told you about of inflammation happening in their hand. That's why the hand is red and nothing else is red. We're going to make changes to the blood vessel only in the hand. Everywhere else, we're not going to see changes in the blood vessel diameter. We're not going to see changes in permeability. We're not going to see recruitment of cells over here. It's only just in this one local site. Um, there are other things that some of those cytokines and chemokines can do elsewhere in the body to help support this immune response. So we do also see some systemic effects of the inflammatory cytokines. Um, one of those effects is an effect on the liver. So those same cytokines, like IL-6 and TNF-alpha, can move through the bloodstream. They're not going to affect the vessels, but they are going to affect the liver. And they are going to make the liver make some new proteins. Um, you can see that here. So you can see, here's the IL-6 receptor on the liver. Here's the IL-6 interacting with the liver. And now the liver makes some new proteins. Um, anybody remember here? So one of the proteins it makes is um, mannose binding lectin. Anybody ever heard of mannose binding lectin? Yes? When did you, where did you hear of mannose binding lectin? Yeah. Inquisitive. Inquisitive? Anywhere else? Yeah. Yeah, it was one of the pathways that we learned about on Friday, the complement cascade. Um, C-reactive protein, also a complement-related protein. Um, fibrinogen is related to blood clots. Um, this is showing you uh, some other complement components. So the liver is going to start making more of those proteins we learned about on Friday. Again, because all of these things are really interconnected. So the liver is going to say, OK, there's bacteria here. We probably are going to need some more complement proteins. And it's going to start making complement proteins to help out this process. Um, the part where the liver is making some of these things is known as the acute phase response. Those same cytokines are going to act on the bone marrow. And when those cytokines act on the bone marrow, that tells the bone marrow, hey, um, release any extra neutrophils you have. 
send out more neutrophils. Um, so that there are now more neutrophils in the body to try to get rid of the microbe. Um, we can also see those same cytokines have effects at the hypothalamus and at fat and muscle. Both of those things end up being impacts on metabolism And much of that impact on metabolism changes your body temperature. And that uh, specifically increases your body temperature, makes your body temperature a little hotter. So that bacteria and viruses can't reproduce as well. So we're going to increase uh, body temperature to make it less of a good environment for bacteria to replicate hasn't made it to the textbooks yet, but we actually also are realizing that immune cells travel better when it's hot, too. Um, they travel around the body better. So um, we're going to see these kind of changes in body temperature. What's another word for an increase in body temperature? What do you usually call that? Yeah, fever. Um, so these inflammatory cytokines are leading to fever. Um, and so if, and so you can see this is showing some of those effects of the inflammatory cytokines on the liver to make that acute phase response, on the bone marrow to release uh, more cells, on the brain, um, where they can do things like um, impact body temperature. Sometimes they can make you feel a little sleepy, um, lethargic, muscle pain, no appetite, nausea, kind of feel blah. Malaise is official term for that. Um, so notice that many of these are the things that you think of as being sick. Yet they're not anything the microbe did to you. They're things that your immune system did to you. They are actually signs that your innate immune response is happening. Some of that is because you're going to make some metabolic changes to start working on defense instead of other things. Um, and part of that is actually to make some of those metabolic changes for fever. Um, so what I'd like people to realize is, you know, know that these symptoms are actually signs that your immune system is doing something. Um, I, Often, uh, I am planning to get um, some vaccines later this week, and I assume I will have a little bit of fever and a little bit of aches and things like that. And whenever my friends get vaccines and they complain on, on social media about like, oh, I feel crappy because I got my vaccine. Um, yeah, it's a, you're supposed to. That means your immune system's doing its job. And I always write a comment like, I'm so glad to hear the, your immune system is working as it should, and no one has punched me yet. Um, they would definitely have thought they, I'm pretty sure they definitely thought about it. Um, so, um, realize that, um, you know, these, these physiologic signs, these physiologic things that you are feeling are in fact signs that your, um, immune response is, uh, happening as it should. Um, I also just have a, a list here. We're talking, we've been talking about cytokines and specifically we've been talking about inflammatory cytokines. Every so often I have some students who look at this and are like, oh, all cytokines are inflammatory cytokines. No, that's just one kind of them. There's other kinds of cytokines. There actually are anti-inflammatory ones. There are survival cytokines. There, there are all sorts of kinds. So we're talking about a specific kind, the inflammatory kind. So don't think that all cytokines necessarily are inflammatory. Um, so once we have our macrophage that was living in the tissue detecting bacteria that has entered, making inflammatory cytokines as a result of PRR signaling. Um, and we have those cytokines making changes in the local vessel as well as chemokines calling in other cells. 
Now we can have additional cells coming into this area and those invading cells are going to be able to kill uh, bacteria. Um, and in particular, these invading cells are neutrophils now um, as opposed to macrophages. Yep. Um, so Jay asks if blood clotting has anything to do with the immune system. If you look in most immunology textbooks, you would not think so. However, um, more and more we realize the answer is yes. In fact, many important proteins in the blood clotting cascade are either made downstream of the acute phase response or are actually made by the macrophage because of PRR signaling. Um, and those are, and to be honest with you, I didn't even totally understand that until the COVID-19 pandemic, um, when we started seeing patients having weird things going on with blood clotting. So the answer is yes. Um, it's perhaps not well understood. And sometimes I'm like, hey, immunologists, uh, you, you know that fixing the wound probably should be something our system does too. We, we shouldn't, we, we should probably think about that. Um, so wound healing is kind of this newer area um, and blood clotting falls in with there too. So yes, although much, some of that literature is newer than you think it should be. Um, so now we have our neutrophils who are going to come to the site of infection and try to get rid of the microbe. And the neutrophils will do that process by phagocytosis. So you can see that the neutrophil will um, actually extend its membrane out and make a little compartment around um, the microbe. Um, the process, uh, this process is called phagocytosis. And so when the cell gets a new compartment because it wraps a membrane around the microbe, we call that new compartment the phagosome because <laughs> it was an organelle made by phagocytosis. That phagocytosis, that phagosome will then um, fuse with other granules in the cell um, and go through some other changes to become very acidic. And the bacteria will be completely destroyed. You can see that same process in a figure from your textbook here. So here you can see the neutrophil um, starting to engulf the microbe. It makes a phagosome, that new organelle that was created by phagocytosis. And some of the different granules in our granulocyte, in our neutrophil, will fuse with the phagosome so that we can destroy everything that is in that, um, that phagosome. Some of this happens because of different chemical compounds that are held in the phagosome. These chemical compounds are made through a process known as respiratory burst, and they include things like superoxide, hydroxyls, um, hydrogen peroxide, hypochloric acid, um, as well as um, these are all reactive oxygen species, as well as some reactive nitrogen species. Yes. Peach goes uh, down, more acidic. Yeah. Does it? Well, that's no good. It should say goes down because it gets acidic. <laughs> Thank you for catching that. Um, there are also, see, acidification. <laughs> um, there are also a number of different enzymes in those granules that will um, help to break down those microbes. And then one final thing will happen, and this is the final thing that I'll leave you with today. After the neutrophil goes through this process of doing phagocytosis and killing microbes, the neutrophil dies. 
Um, so neutrophils are very, very short-lived cells. They basically are going to be a little Pac-Man to eat some bacteria, and then they're going to die. Those neutrophils will probably get phagocytosed by a macrophage in order to um, recycle nutrients. Um, but the neutrophils don't live that long. And you actually already knew that the, mac or that the neutrophils die um, because you may have seen a collection of dead neutrophils on a wound before which is pus. So that white icky stuff that you see when you have a wound that's healing, that's pus, that's all the dead neutrophils. Um, if you are ever going to make a lecture about this, do not do a Google image search for pus to try to put an image on your slide because you will get things you didn't want to see. Um, so I will see you guys here tomorrow for lab. The lab handout is already posted. Um, you're gonna wanna make sure that you have it and are ready to go tomorrow. You definitely need lab coats tomorrow. Um, so I'll see you tomorrow.